Welcome, welcome, welcome to Pop Up Live, Arthur's Live. I am Queenie Clem with Queenie's Book Talk and Reviews, and I am the admin in this wonderful, wonderful group, Readers and the Authors We Love. This is a group where readers and authors connect to have fun, connect, and read. Today on the panel, I have Felicia Lucas. Uh, Miss Pelzer and Teresa Stoll. The Pop Up Authors Live is a platform for authors to talk about their books and themselves for 10 minutes. They talk about all their books and can even read a snippet from their book. And the first author up is Felicia Lucas. Welcome, Felicia. How are you doing? Hello. Hi, I'm great today. How are you? Fine. Okay, you can go ahead and Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Felicia Lucas. I'm actually new to this group. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I am the CEO of His Glory Creations Publishing, where we're an international Christian publishing company that helps authors, just like many that are in this group, publish their works. Um, I am a 15-time literary project contributor or author. Um, excited about what's on the horizon. Uh, my first book I actually wrote back in 2016, um, and it is called Make It Happen, Moving Towards Your Best You. And this book was a collection of many life experiences that I had and how I was able to overcome through uh, prayer, through my relationship with God. I talk about my relationship I have with my, my husband. I talk about um, my health and wellness. Uh, there was a point in my life that I was really out of balance. And um, I talked about what I actually did in order to get back on track. I even delve into my life as a professional. I've been a human resources professional for over 25 years. I am in training and development. So this gave me an opportunity to share with the world how we can't just sit around and wait for things to happen in life. We actually have to take make efforts to make it happen. And so this is my signature book. I, um, this is my baby, as I say, but as I said, I have 15 other projects today and I'll, I'll share some of them with you, um, on this afternoon. Um, my second book I wrote is called Get in the Game. It is a teen's play playbook for winning the game of life. This book is ideal for uh, students that are in middle school and high school trying to figure out what do they want to do in order to be successful. Um, so I provide tried and true tips and strategies, um, starting with the sixth grade all the way up through 12th grade, what you need to do to be successful. Um, the motto in my house is um, you can get a job, you can get a, a, a college education, you can go to the army, but sitting on my couch is not an option. So getting in the game uses basketball. It talks about how we all have the four quarters in our life and how we're supposed to move forward. So this is a great book for teenagers, especially the middle school age, um, because by the time they get to high school, they should already have the correct foundation in order to be successful. Um, one of the things that our company is very uh, passionate about are anthologies. So I currently have, uh, actually I have one that's going to be launching tonight on, actually on Facebook. Um, and the type of, um, the name of the series is Down for the Count, Bouncing Back from Life's Blows. So um, we're currently on volume four. So that's volume one and two. Oh, three, I got my camera on backwards. And volume four is actually bouncing back or, or debuting tonight. And these are stories of individuals who have uh, experienced uh, many adversities in life. And the key to that is how do you bounce back? And so back in 2017, when I uh, published my first anthology, which was called the bounce back. Um, I had a group of women, there's 10 of us on the back as well, that started this movement about how do you bounce back? And now is a very vital time to talk about how do you bounce back? The world is not as we have always known it. And there's a lot of people now that are down for the count and mm -hmm. they want a little inspiration as to how to bounce back. Well, in our books, um, each of our authors tell those stories, some of those hard
hard stories that they've experienced as to how they have bounced back. Um, another, another series of anthologies that I started on last year is called He Knows My Name, Inspirational Stories of God's Love for His Daughters. So this is a different kind of anthology, um, not really talking about adversity and calamity mm -hmm. and resiliency. It really talks about God's love. And mm -hmm. I had a personal experience where I experienced God's love, which actually prompted this book. And I partnered again. I'm all, I'm all about collaborating and partnering. I partnered with nine other young ladies that tell our stories about how we knew that God is there for us. Um, and so the, the essence of our company, we're about inspiration. We're about empowerment. We're about life changing. Mm -hmm. We're about how do we educate people through our stories? Because we know our stories are so important. What we've gone through, there's someone out there waiting to hear exactly what we went through and not only what what we went through, but how do we, how did we make it through? And so I counted an honor. I counted a privilege to be able to serve. I've served over 60 people in either their um, being a part of my anthologies or producing their own books. And so I, I, I got quite a few of those today. I'm just going to kind of go through real quick. Um, some of them, um, I have children's book authors that work with me. I have um, authors that have pr produced poetry. Um, we have a plethora of, um, this is a book that's actually in Spanish. This whole book is in Spanish. It's a book of poetry. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, we also, I also have an author, the same author that she did a nonfiction book and it's in Spanish as well. Um, but I work with authors that have these inspirational stories, Broken No More. This is by Judy Mojica. I have um, Mary Hooks, Be, Comf Be Completely Comfortable with, in Which the Way God Uses You. And so for me, just to to have that opportunity to inspire. So I just say on today, whatever is in your heart, whatever God has given you as your gift, work your gift, walk in your gift. This time of quarantine for some of us that are not allowed to go out is an excellent time for you to tap into your resources, get that journal out, start writing. Um, I've written a book since I've been out for the last 30 days. So I have written a book I submitted it yesterday for publication. Um, I was being very serious about, I'm going to put out what God said. So mm -hmm. let's not waste time. Let's not waste this season. Some of us have been praying for uh, a break. Some of us have been praying that, you know, you're tired, you need rest. Absolutely, we all need that. But those of us that are in this season, how are you maximizing what those thoughts that you have at night? Mm -hmm. I get up in the middle of the night, God has given me things, I'm writing those down. Don't allow this opportunity of slow down to um, to miss it. So I am so thankful today for give, for you giving me an opportunity to share not only about what the Lord has done for me through writing, but to encourage other people to continue, keep pushing through. I never even thought I would have a publishing company. The, my publishing company was birthed because someone saw what I did and they asked me, can you help me? And I said, well, you know what? I just mm -hmm. went through this process. Yes, I totally can. And from that, his glory creations publishing was birthed. So thank you again mm -hmm. for this opportunity to share. Um, I uh, I really appreciate it. All right. Would you All like right. to read your, 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 your book? Sure. I'll read. Um, yes, sure. I'll read a quick story. Um, this is the one that I... Um, Yes, I will read. Here we go. It's out of my Make It Happen book. Um, it's, it's a story that talks about um, me going through um, transition. It says, it was a clear and sunny, sunny day, and my family and I were on our summer vacation. Each year, we try to take our children to a destination spot alternating one year as the educational trip with the following year as a fun trip. Generally, mm -hmm. on the educational trips, we visit historical places to include museums and science-related locations. On this particular fun vacation, we chose a full day at a theme park. Of course, these theme parks have all sorts of rides and adventures for the entire family. While growing up, I was very adventurous, so whenever I visited a theme park, I would ride the daring rides, including roller, roller coasters. I remember riding a few roller coasters over and over again, sometimes eight to 10 times in a row. Standing in a line, long line in the hot July heat was well worth the thrill that the ride provided. 
I honestly enjoyed the funny feeling that I would get in my stomach as the roller coaster would make sharp turns and drop quickly from a higher altitude. The higher the thrill, the more I wanted to ride. I especially wanted to ride the ones that took me upside down. On this particular vacation, my husband suggested that we ride one of the low thrill ride attractions. This is about the extent of his thrill ride adventures. He generally doesn't ride roller coasters. Oh, let me rephrase that. He will ride the kiddie coasters with our children on occasion. So he and I stood in line for a few minutes and at the appropriate time proceeded to our seats to begin their ride. He instantly gets into his seat, buckles up and waits for the ride to begin. I go to my seat, sit down, grab the seat belt, and guess what? I couldn't get it to clasp. I pulled and I pulled, but I couldn't get it to budge. It didn't clasp. Why? Because I was too big for the ride. The ride operator came over and also tried to buckle it and was unable to do so. So he politely said, sorry, ma'am, you need to take the next exit. Oh, man. Boy, was I very embarrassed. I remember walking towards the exit and I went and sat down. I watched as my husband went around and around the ride, having fun while I sat with tears rolling down my cheeks. I never shared with him what exactly happened, but I knew in that moment a change had to occur. And I was determined the next time that we went to the amusement park, I would be able to ride my, any ride that I wanted to. When I reached this point in my life, in order for me to be all that God had called me to be, I had to mentally shift my thinking about my health and my attitudes towards fitness. When I reached the point of enough is enough, I was able to make long term changes. So for me, that was my personal account as to when I found out, well, I came to the realization that I wasn't healthy. And I needed to be uh, moving more towards my best self. And it was a wake up call for me. And so that is one part of this story that I would like to share with you that I share with you on today. So thank you. All right. All right. Okay. 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 Yes. So I am on all social media platforms. I'm on Facebook as Felicia Lucas. Um, you can go to my website, which is FeliciaLucas.com. Um, FeliciaLucas.com. And you can click on books and you'll be able to see all of them there. Um, I also am on PayHip. And if you can do www.payhip.com slash H G his glory C creations publishing hold on i tell you i got all this stuff running through my head right now it's payhip.com slash hgcp and you can see all of my book projects there uh, but visit us on the website like my facebook page here's glory creations publishing um i would love to connect with you especially if you're interested in doing an anthology i do have several uh, in the future so if you're interested please inbox me all right thank all you right, thank you thank you Bye-bye. 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 All right. That was Felicia Lucas. That was Felicia Lucas. And you can purchase her books again, like she said, at Amazon. And you can find her on Facebook. Um. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, I'm waiting for the next um, person to come in. I'm waiting, waiting. Yolanda, can you hear me? Okay. Who's next? Okay, the next um, author we have on the panel. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you? Hey, hey, hey. How are you? Fine. Introduce yourself and tell us all about your book, and you can read snippets from your book. Thank Out to these pals are here, your voice manager, and I unmute the voice of women who are ready to speak up about what has kept her silent for way too long. Um, I currently am the author and slash co-author of 15 books that are 
I don't have all 15 here, so don't think I'm gonna read from all 15. <laughs> I got you. I know, I know. You're like, I understand we in quarantine, but uh ma'am, I don't want you to sit here and read to me like we in preschool. I get it. But here are three of the books, and I'm going to read you a piece from the first book. My first book was actually published in 2016. It was It's Okay to Cry. And it was during a time when I was homeless. Uh, it was during a time when uh, I was restructuring uh, my business. It was also a time where uh, I was just coming to grips with telling someone that I myself had been molested as a child and dealing with everything that we had endured with taking care of my, my children uh, after finding out that they had been molested as well. And it's, you know, the interesting piece of it is that uh, the, the lessons that I learned along the way, uh, you know, when writing a book, when, when putting your story out there, a lot of times you think that our story is not significant or that nobody's going to really resonate with the story. Listen, I thought even on the title on this one, y'all, okay? I was like, who wants to read a story about somebody, it, it's being okay to cry, but it was definitely God sent. Uh, and I found that out through connecting with people online. And listen, that's, that's how it started. And 15 books later, I'm still pushing them out. Listen. <laughs> It's interesting because right now we're really going through uh, a, a interesting scenario and situation that we've not been in before when it comes to being quarantine, when it comes to COVID-19. And one of the things that I talked about in the book was don't stop crying out. Um, I don't want us to ever get to a point where we feel as though that we cannot talk about what we're going through, that we can't ask for help, we can't ask for support. It's necessary for us to do so in order for us to get what it is that we need in this time. So don't stop crying out, don't stop speaking out. An outcry is an instance of crying as an articulate utterance of distress, rage, or pain. And when you cry out to God, keep him as your focus. What happened as a child when you really wanted something? You went to your parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, or whoever would listen and repeatedly brought what you desired to their attention. You didn't stop until you had someone on your side. Why don't we show that same enthusiasm when it comes to crying out to God? Sure, we curse him for letting the situation happen. And then we cry out to him for help. But what do we do after that? Do you continue to go to God until you get an answer? You should. And to continue to cry out to God through prayer, fasting, and reading his word. Don't let go of the joy you want to receive. Crying out is about healing, joy, pain, or fear. The tears we shed are often more helpful than we think. And I know that there are many people who are crying out in this season. They're crying out in this time thinking that, oh, what was me? There's no, un it's, it's a place of uncertainty. We don't know what's gonna happen next, where this season is going to take us. But guess what, guys, you can still cry out. And I don't just know, I know that, you know, some people may say, oh, just go to God in prayer and, and it'll all work out. Well, listen, let's be honest here. I need you to understand that sometimes it means a little bit more than that. It may be a time for you to go to counseling. This may be a time for you to go and speak to a, a pastor or a deacon and, and literally just be able to share what's on your heart and what's on your chest and get it out there. Don't think that whatever you're going through is insignificant. I think that's one of the most important pieces that we remember when it comes to being it, you know, being able to cry and knowing that it's OK to cry. It's understanding that I have value. And so what I'm going through is significant. What I'm feeling is significant. And there's somebody that not only will listen, but there's also someone that can help. So that part was very valuable. It was very important for me to share that. And here it is. I This was shared uh, way before COVID-19, way before, you know, quarantine and um, our teens going through so much right now. And 
you know, I was even talking to my girls this morning, or two of my girls, and it, it breaks my heart what they're going through right now. Because as a mother, there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people feel like they're in that space. Like, I, I have no control over what's going on right now. And to that person, I want to say, cry out. This is your time to go and find support groups. This is your time to go and find the help that you need. Do not allow this to be the time where you clam up and think you have to go through this alone. I think that's one of the most valuable things that we've learned right now is that we're not in this alone. Thank you. Thank you. Now, where can readers find you and your books? Oh, they can connect with me online. Um, I always tell people, come join the conversation. Our free Facebook community uh, is hashtag World Voice League. If you go to bit.ly forward slash World Voice Community, you can come and join the conversation. We're always talking about things, uplifting each other. It's a global community of men and women from just all parts, podcasters, CEOs and founders of magazines, everybody and anybody is in this one community. Uh, and it's definitely a great place for you to find some support, some creativity, uh, and some answers sometimes because, you know, they've been posting some great information uh, mm -hmm. to be able to support. Uh, one of our members did a live stream talking about uh, the uses of 211 and 411, which in my era, <laughs> my generation may know about, but some of the generations after me don't really know um, fully what they are for or how to utilize them. So definitely connect there. And if you're looking to get the book, if you go to bit.ly forward slash press series, that's P-R-E-S-S -S series, you'll go to my author central page, which you'll be able to see a ton of my books, including my first one, It's Okay to Cry. Oh, my pleasure. You guys have a good one. You too. Bye -bye. All right, the next person that we have up is Teresa Stovall. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm good, Queenie. Thank you. It's Teresa Rhymes with Vanessa, but it's all good. How are you? <laughs> Fine. Okay, can, tell us about yourself and your okay. book. You can read a snippet from your book. Thanks so much. Hi, um, I want to say hello to all the readers, to all my fellow authors. Also, I loved Altaviz's message that came just before this. I really resonated with me and I'm a big fan of crying and expressing yourself. So I just want to say I was really touched and moved by her and her message. Um, hello, <laughs> greetings, and thank you for having me. My name is Teresa Stovall. I've um, been a writer my whole life. I've written lots of different books, written, co-written, co-edited fiction, nonfiction. And recently, in the last five years, I've had my behind kicked by an ancestral non-negotiable assignment to write a memoir. And it's a memoir that is specifically about one area of my very um, multifaceted life, which is the evolution of my racial identity. Okay. <laughs> and I wrote it, even when I started it five years ago, the conversations around mixed race people, and racially ambiguous people, which as you can see, I am both, um, weren't really, they were starting up for the first time in my life and I'm 65 years old. So for the first time in my life, there were public ongoing conversations about this topic helped by the fact that we're in the digital world, social media, census categories, Barack Obama, public conversations finally about colorism and racism and all those things, which is something I've been waiting for. Literally, my, I've been talking to myself about these things my whole life and writing about them for a long time on and off. But I got this assignment to write this memoir, which I'll share in a minute. But some of my previous books, um, kind of in an eclectic array, and I want to share three of my favorites. Um, one of them, which came out around 2000, I co-edited, uh, co-wrote, ironically with my now ex-husband or my husband and father of our two beautiful children. So we went from being a married couple to going through a crazy divorce to being very amicable, productive co-parents. But the book is about black love and marriage. It came out 20 years ago, 20 years ago, and it was featured on Oprah and it got a lot of publicity. And this was back in the day when you did big book tours 
we had a seven city book tour and it's called A Love Supreme, Real Life Stories of Black Love. So that was my first big book and it was an amazing experience. It was wonderful and it was, it was our effort to, you gotta remember 20 years ago, there was still not a, a really well-known concept that healthy black love and marriage existed. Mm -hmm. So this was part of our um, effort to put that narrative into reality, right? Okay, and then the second one was um, a novel. My first, this is the only novel I've had published. And this is these are galleys because the other copies are all packed up. But this was a fun novel, what would probably be called, they were trying to, um, create urban chick lit. This was back in the early 2000s it was called The Hot Spot. And it was published by BET and then by Kensington. So that was just a fun book. And then another, my favorite book was done with three co-authors, Tracy Price Thompson, Desiree Cooper, Elizabeth Atkins. It was the first in a series of empowerment books for black women. And it's called Other People's Skin. And it tackles colorism and healing from colorism and heroism and featureism among black women. So those are my favorites and other people's skin is really my favorite. So what we have now just out in the last couple of weeks is my memoir, very controversial. It's very, very raw. And it's, it tells things that have never been said, never been written, never been revealed in the USA. I would certainly in my whole life, I would say probably ever, about being mixed race. It's just very raw. It's not about being confused, rejected, or tragic at all. It's a confrontation of those. It's a refutation of those stereotypes and those things while acknowledging that they're real, that they're valid, and why they exist. So this is Swirl Girl, coming of race in the USA. And it starts on the day of April 4th, 1968 on the day of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination. I am from Seattle, Washington. And so most of the book is set in Seattle. And I'm most of it takes place when I'm very, very young. It starts when I'm 13 years old in the eighth grade, middle school. But what I wanna share is chapter 11. This is what Spirit led me to share today, which is about my father, George Kelly Stone, a black man. Um, and our relationship, my parents were divorced very early on and he had a unique role. But this is the, what I was feeling growing up about him, my relationship with him and the types of things he said to me about my own identity. The chapter is called, You Can Be. My father's attitude about my identity made me wonder if he regretted having made mixed children. I couldn't tell if he hated his own blackness or thought I'd be better off pretending that it didn't exist. Though he lived nearby, he stayed on the outskirts of our lives. While mom did double duty as a parent, he made clear that he had no interest in playing a fatherly role. He didn't know what my little brother and I liked to eat. He had no idea that I was a bookworm, a tomboy, an aspiring author, or that my brother Greg was both a natural salesperson who could convince anyone to do anything and a gifted athlete who taught me to swim underwater when he was only three years old. And dad never paid a dime of the ridiculously paltry $10 a month that the court assigned him as child support for Greg and me. Though she deserved that money and much more, mom never complained about dad's lack of financial support. She didn't say much about him at all, except that he'd been the love of her life, handsome, witty, charismatic, and talented. As a young tap dancer, his style was compared to his idols, the Nicholas brothers. When dad's knees gave out from his acrobatic dancing, he channeled his rhythms into becoming a jazz drummer. And though he'd been an alcoholic all his life, he was disciplined. He never got drunk during the work week or drove a car while under the influence. I'd never seen or heard evidence of his musical talent, so I had to take mom's word for it. I was two when he left, and after that, we never exchanged a smile, a hug, or a tender moment. I never heard him say, I love you, or I'm glad you're my kid. The wit, talent, and charisma that mom described seemed buried in a haze of alcohol and bitterness. On special occasions, dad invited Greg and me over for his delicious barbecue. On regular weekend visits when he wasn't on the grill, he listened to good jazz, drank beer, drenched all his food in hot sauce, and got on my nerves. 
But as his child, part of me still hungered to forge a bond with him, find common ground, a way to make sense of our connection. One Saturday, we sat in his house watching news reports of the race riots blazing upon across America's inner cities with cries of black power coming from the screen. He stared impassively, nursing a beer. Desperate to forge a sense of connection, I gathered my nerve and reached out to share something close to my heart. I read this book by Malcolm X. He set his beer bottle down hard on the wooden coffee table. I don't need to hear about that shit. I've lived it. He studied my face as though he'd never seen it before. What's your problem? Why are you trying so hard to be black? I'm not trying to be anything, I retorted. Why are you trying to deny your blackness? We locked eyes. Stop telling people you're black, he said. You can be, he waved his free hand around, anything you want. The way you look, you can tell people anything. I don't need to tell people I'm anything when I'm already something, I said, my voice rising with frustration. He looked sad. You're too young to understand what you're throwing away. Throwing away, I cried. I'll bet you haven't even heard of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. He snorted. Those young spooks don't know what they're doing. The old fays are going to kill them all. At least they're proud of who they are. He shook his head. Yelling black power won't get anyone anywhere. You need to stop holding yourself back with that mess. He changed the channel from the news of racial unrest to a game show. I ran outside to sit on his porch in the rain, crying nonstop until mom picked us up. That night, I laid awake asking God why George Kelly Stone had to be my father, why the man who gave me my blackness was telling me to throw it away, deny it, because he believed that living a lie was a better option. I had flashes of memory from when he lived with us before Greg was born. As a toddler, I watched adoringly as he shaved in the bathroom mirror. I sat on his lap while we watched TV. Sometimes he gave me a sip from the foam at the top of his beer. I hated the taste, but loved the feeling of being close to him, of being a daughter, of having a daddy. On the flip side, I remembered him and mom shouting at each other in what felt like an endless loop of conflicts about money and other women. I was two and Greg was in mom's womb when she finally put him out. I vividly recalled how the tension went with him. I didn't hate him for leaving mom, but I hate how he, I hated how he'd hurt her. And for all the times he said he was coming to get Greg and me, but didn't show up. I recall one of the rare times he had shown up and taken us with him to the Madison Plaza drugstore on 23rd Madison Street. I was eight and Greg was five. We were about to go into the store when a long faced black man in a hat called, hey, Kelly. Dad smiled and motioned the man over. Hey, man, how you doing? They slapped palms as a stranger stared hard at Greg and me eyes full of questions I was already starting to recognize. That you, he asked, nodding in our, his, nodding in our direction. Yeah, man, dad said with a self-conscious smile. Ain't they pretty? I knew what pretty meant. Dad was bragging about having fathered kids with real light skin and wavy hair. Mm -hmm. I sat down, stared down at his spit shine black Stacy Adams shoes, swallowing the lump of fire that rose in my throat. That's all we were to him trophies in some one-up game that grown-ups like to play. I wondered whether dad would view or treat us differently if we shared his coppery color. Would he brag about our looks then? When he claimed I could be anything, I heard him suggesting he'd be cool with me changing my name, denying my ancestors, lying about every aspect of my being and pretending he didn't even exist. He acted like blackness was only for those whose bodies didn't give them other options, a stain that I should avoid and escape for as long as I could pull it off. At the dawn of my teen years, as our nation rocked and rolled with shifting race relations, what I wanted most was for dad to hold up his end of the deal as a parent of mixed kids by standing tall and being proud of his identity, like mom was proud of hers. Even if he hadn't wanted Greg and me, even if he didn't love us or felt something but didn't know how to show it, the very least he could do was express pride in his own ancestry. It was hard for me to respect him when he wouldn't even give me that. Wow. That's cool, girl. So like I said, this book's gonna, this is, these are, these are things that people don't talk about. Mm -hmm. People don't talk about publicly, that people don't unpack. 
on these topics. And so this is this book is my effort to bring some layers to the conversation that ultimately help to unite us because we're born pitted against each other. The system keeps us pitted against each other. Uh, we, we all understand that. We all know all the reasons why. One of my purposes in life, and especially in my writing, is to try to challenge that in whatever way I can. So that's why I wrote Swirl Girl, Coming of Race in the USA. Thank you so much. And we get in touch with you and work on you purchase your book. Um, Teresa Stovall, just the way it is on the screen, but with no space and you don't have to uppercase anything, dot com, teresastovall.com is the website where you can purchase the book. And you can find me under this name on Facebook and at Teresa Talks, all one word on Instagram and Twitter. But Teresa Stovall, all one word, all lowercase dot com. Please come and support me. Please buy Swirl Girl and help to counteract the narratives that keep us from being united and working in solidarity to conquer racism. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Bye bye. All right, that was Ter Teresa Stovall, Swirl Girl. She's on Facebook and she's on um, Amazon, I believe. Okay, next we have Yolanda Bradley. La Yolanda? Hello. Okay, you can tell us who you are, you? about your books, and you can read a snippet. Okay, well, I uh, wrote my first book for children, girls, which is called Unique by Lane Bird. And uh, the reason I wrote that, uh, Queenie, was because I, I believe that our girls need empowerment and, and encouragement. The things that our parents used to do for us. Mother used to, she was an educator for 40 years. And she used to wake up in the morning and she'll say, don't you ever let anyone tell you what you can't do. You look in that mirror every day and say, I can do this and I can do that. And you believe it in your heart. And I think our young girls are missing that right now. So I wrote a girl, I wrote a book for our young girls to, to be empowered, encouraged, and to know that they are beautiful because God made us unique. See? Being unique is unlike anything else in this world. You don't have to be like nobody else. You are different because you are made that way. So uh, I made this, I wrote this book, it was my first book, and I'm proud of it. And uh, one night I was just sitting up and I asked God, what do you want me to do? And this book was a vision that came to me. And I'm going to read just a, a, a couple pages of it. And it's for girls from ages 3 to 12. I am brown like cocoa. I am dark as the night. I am light like vanilla ice cream. I am pale as the moon because I am an albino. I am unique. My hair is straight. My hair is kinky. My hair is soft, curly, and woolly. I am happy with my hair. I am beautiful. I am unique because that's how God made me. And it not only goes on, it goes on with your eyes and your lips because we are made in a different kind of way. And we are made so beautiful. So we are made with different features. So it not only talks about your features and it's in your skin, it also Queenie tells you what you can be. I can be a teacher who teaches math, science, English, and class. I can be a reporter. I can be a senator. I can be an attorney. I can be an engineer. And I can be a scientist. I am free to be me. I am unique. I owe you nothing. 
<laughs> I owe me everything because that's how unique I can be. All right, can we see some of the pictures? Yes, ma'am. Yes, can you hold it up a little bit? I had can we see the pictures. I have a wonderful, yes. wonderful illustrator. And you believe it or not, she's in college. And she just, uh, oh my goodness, she did a wonderful job with these pictures. And the character right here, the character right here, her name is Uniqua. So the book is called Unique. Mm -hmm. And the character is Uniqua. Okay. So you can you can find my book on Amazon, Walmart, Barnes and Noble. You can also get it at my publisher, jimlightpublishing.com. And you can find me on Facebook under Arthur Lane Bird. And you can find me on Twitter under Bradley Y. Bradley. And you can also get me at my email at Yolanda Bradley at gmail.com. All right. Thank you so much for coming in today. I really appreciate it. Well, you are so welcome. And I'm working on another one, Miss Queenie. And it's going to be about puberty and adolescence in young girls. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. You too. All right. Y'all heard it. Now we had, that was Yolanda Bradley. We had Alta Viz. I'm, I know I'm messing these names up. I'm butchering them up. Pelzer. Teresi, 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 I think she said, Stovert, and Felicia Lucas. You can always uh, replay to get all the information, but they're right here in the group. Readers and the authors we love. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Out of these, Therese, Teresi. Therese. Ta I think I got it right. Teresia. <laughs> I know she's laughing at me. And Felissa. Thank y'all so, so, so much for coming in today to our midday uh, pop up Arthur's Live Thursday edition. We will be back at 6 30 with six more authors. I hope y'all will come back at 6 30. PM Eastern Standard Time. I really, really, really do appreciate everyone who has came in and we welcome every, all the newbies that has come in. Make sure that you um, come in and go to the pin post at the top of the page and introduce yourself and also join in any discussions. If you would like to go live, let me know and I'll let you go live. If you'd like to do a live um, about your books more or read more from your books or do more about your books or let us know about your books. I'm thinking about doing another author takeover for a day. If you're interested in being an author for a takeover, for a takeover, let me know, let me know, let me know. Um, again, I am Queenie Clem. I am the admin in this group. I know I do not own this group. I'm not the founder of this group. The founder of this group is Jennifer Sunshine Campbell. Um, I have literally like taken over in the last two, three years because she's out writing a book of her own. And since I have no life, I tell y'all that all the time, I, she asked me to um, oversee her group while she's in IAS writing a book. We also have a moderator in the group. She is an author too. She was on a couple of days ago, if I'm not mistaken, Alethea. Alethea Gibbs, Gibbs Truth, No Lie. She is also in the group. She's a moderator and she is a author. So if you want to find her book, hook, hook, hook up with her in the group. If you're an author, 
You can also, um, I'm giving you permission to um, shout out your book. Um, two links, two book links only per day. Uh, if I see you doing more, I will uh, delete you. Um, I really, 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 really enjoy this group. I love, I love to read. My passion is reading. That's what I do. Um, at this present time, I think I'm reading three books at one time and an audio book. So um, that's me, Queenie. And also I have a uh, Queenie's book talk and reviews on YouTube. I have a channel on YouTube and I also have um, a blog. What I do on my blog, I do not do on my channel. And I do author interviews on both. I do written and I do video. So if you would like to connect with me on that, please do. Um, I'm also um, have Queenie's editing services. I do editing and I do beta reading. I love to read y'all. That's my passion. Um, I have a nine year old. He loves to read also. He's written three books, three books. Uh, one is in his school library. One is in his classroom and he just finished writing one this past summer. No, they're not published, but um, I don't know. But anyway, this is Queenie Clem with Queenie's Book Talk and Reviews and Readers and Authors We Love. I'll see you back at 630. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to the authors that came in today. I really, really appreciate you. Much love. See y'all later. 630. Bye.